Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. Hello, and welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is Amit Varma, host of the podcast, The Seen and the Unseen, which is a leading podcast in India. Amit's also a writer, teacher, and a former professional poker player, among other things. And last but not least, Amit's been the producer of my Brave New World podcast since its inception over two and a half years ago. We're recording this podcast in a studio in Bombay, but get this, it's the first time we've actually met face to face. We're going to talk about, quote unquote, the creator economy, a term Amit uses to describe a world where people express themselves unfettered from traditional gatekeepers, channels, and formats. He is certainly unfettered. Some of his podcasts run for eight hours, so he's clearly learned how to tap into people's attention in an era of a deficit of attention. Amit, welcome to Brave New World. I am super delighted to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Vasant. You know, I've, you know, uh, sat through some more than 60 of your recordings and in all of them, you tell your guests, welcome to Brave New World. I'm delighted to have you on the show. So to know that you're super delighted to have me on is a great honor and I've had you on my show. So it's, it's, it's so good to be welcomed here and to finally meet you in person. I know. How bizarre is this, right? I mean, we've been doing this for two and a half years. You know, I've been seeing you on the screen and it really is a brave new world, right? Where we finally meet after two and a half years, you know, face to face. Yeah, I mean, just for the sake of the listeners, since I've started producing this show, we'll always see each other through a screen on Squadcast or whatever we're using to record or Zoom if you're having a conversation. And I was just mentioning to you yesterday when, you know, when you landed in Bombay and we hadn't yet met. And it's a miracle of the modern age that you can feel like you're good friends with a person, really good friends with a person without ever meeting them in person. And it's almost like magic. It's almost like sci-fi. I know. Bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Super bizarre. Because, you know, because I, I and I, and, and you're so right, you know, because I do consider you a really good friend, right? Even though we'd never met, completely virtual. I'm a big sci-fi fan. And there's a book by Asimov called The Naked Sun, which actually was a motivation for me starting Brave New World, you know, as a podcast. And in that story, there's this earth colony that's out in space and they're germaphobes. And they never meet each other. And there's a murder that's happened. There was no crime there. And an Earth sergeant or constable or whatever is sent to uh, this planet. It's called Solera or something like that. I don't remember exactly. And he's sent to solve the crime. And he meets the main guy. And they have this meeting. And then he realizes it was virtual, you know, that this guy wasn't really there. But the technology was so good that they didn't need to meet at all. And the only times they met, when it was essential, they used to maintain a distance of six feet, you know. And this was Asimov in 1957 who wrote this book called The Naked Sun. So feels a little bit like that, you know. That and it's kind of virtual... mind-blowing because actually our friendship also began and our professional collaboration also began during COVID. So the germaphobe thing also exactly. kind of kicks in so yeah, well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, Amit, you're sort of a, you know, people say polymath, poly person, but you're, you're like, you know, I, I view you as so many things, you know, and I've gotten to know you over these years, you know, as a veteran podcaster, but also like as a professional poker player and a writer. And I have a huge amount of respect for people who can actually make money playing poker. So tell us about, you know, yourself. And I know, you know, your listeners know a lot about you, but my listeners don't. So... You know, tell, tell us about your journey and how you've gotten to this point of being a creator. I think sometimes what happens is when we look back on our lives, it's tempting to apply a teleological lens and assume that there is a narrative and it was planned and, you know, everything falls into a, a, a particular storyline. But the story of my life is really stumbling into things. 
you know i just had a vague idea when i graduated from college in 94 that hey i want to write so if i want to write writers don't make money let me be a copywriter i joined advertising then the television boom happened i worked in channel v and mtv in their early days uh for 5 years in the mid 90s to late 90s then i tried to be an entrepreneur in 99 set up something nasdaq crash happened uh, lost a bit of uh, my own money went into debt then i got into journalism for a while i was a managing editor of a site called uh, crickinfo uh started blogging i wrote wrote a blog called india uncut which was extremely popular at one point in time i do five posts a day for about 5 years i did some 8000 posts on it this was in the orties and that blog got me noticed it got me you know column gigs for wall street journal and whatever i was writing op-eds for wsj wrote columns for virtually every indian newspaper over the years left my job while continuing to blog to write a novel which in retrospect uh, i embarrass myself with and hopefully i will redeem myself soon and then i fell in love with poker and i was like okay my great my first great passion in life was writing and i never made any money through that and here's something which i'm passionate about and i can make money through it and i think in poker i started applying what i think is my core skill and my fundamental quality which is to understand something by going to first principles first so you know you do your foundational thinking figure out something and then you apply it which is why for example these days i'm into all the new variants of chess that have come up on chess.com like atomic chess and fog of war because they're completely new the conventional thinking doesn't matter you got to by yourself figure out first principles grok those first principles and then master it and then once i've done that i kind of get bored so i was a professional poker player for 5 years uh it made me more money than uh, writing would have but at one point i realized that it was affecting my lifestyle i i put on a lot of weight i felt like i'm getting stupider because poker is so obsessive you don't have time to read i wouldn't meet my writer friends and i decided to leave and try and get back to writing and in that journey 6 years ago is this is the 7th year i started my podcast um, uh, the seen and the unseen which evolved into a shape i hadn't expected at the time which upturned all my views about podcasting and the creator economy in general and which also i think put me in the center of a time where what it means to create has changed completely and because i was in the thick of it learning by doing so i wasn't doing something because i had figured it out i was do, you know doing stuff and then i was learning from that and that i feel has really taught me so much about the world we are in and the creator economy in particular so what made you become a podcaster and and what were your expectations at that time so today i own and do my podcast alone but at the time there were these guys i partnered with the podcasting house and they kind of approached me and said hey do you want to do something because we used to read your blog and blah 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 and i said okay i had an interesting idea for something i thought i might do on youtube someday is called the seen and the unseen about the unforeseen uh consequences of public policy and it can be a 10 minute thing a 15 minute thing and they said hey just do it in audio do a podcast instead so it was like I realized that in all the big things I have wanted to do in my life like write the books or the stuff I want to do on YouTube now because they are so ambitious I procrastinate and I never even get started but the podcast when it started was a small thing if I had conceived of it then as it has become now I would have been too scared to start but then it was a really small thing and I said theek hai I have a partner I just have to show up at a studio get guests talk about stuff 15 20 minutes that's cool and i had the wrong impression at the time that people have short attention spans so you got to get in there and you got to get out quickly grab their attention finish it off and i found with time that i couldn't be more wrong i realized that you know that it is true that there are moments in time where even you and i will have a short attention span we are swiping and scrolling on our screens and we're in a hurry but there are also times when you and i and everybody else wants to go deep into something but the rest of the media is a mile wide and an inch deep right so people crave depth but they have no way to go for it so what do you do and a podcast is a great medium so i realized two other things about podcasts that were pertinent to this and one is that when people listen to podcasts they are a captive audience you're listening either when you're uh, commuting when you're working out or you're doing errands 
right and you're captive in the sense if i watch a youtube video i can at any moment click on one of the 30 tabs i have open i can pick up a book on the table i can turn my head to talk to someone but if i'm out jogging i'm not going to constantly be switching podcasts i have chosen to listen to something and i listen to it and the second realization about podcasts in particular i mean there are many other uh, things i learned about the creator economy but the second realization about podcasts in particular is that while we speak at about between 150 to 200 words a minute the brain can comprehend words at 500 words a minute and even more right so uh, so therefore we have this unused capacity which is just going waste and which is why sometimes we'll get distracted when someone is talking to us because in real life they're always talking too slowly. But with a podcast, you can gradually take the speed up and, you know, adjust to that. So all power listeners will listen at higher speeds. Uh, and people have different speeds they're comfortable with. But the advice I always give is, you know, take it to 1.2x, let it normalize, take it to 1.5, take it to 2, uh, and normalize it step by step. So you, So these three things come together. Number one, listeners crave depth. Number two, they are a captive audience. And number three, they are listening at higher speeds. So a two-hour conversation will take one hour to consume. And in terms of depth, like I realized this when I did a three-hour, 15-minute episode with the economist Karthik Mulidharan on Indian education. And, and he speaks fast as it is by himself, which was a like a cult episode on the show. And it was three hours, 15 minutes. He got it transcribed. It was 45,000 words. It was like a short book or half a full-length book, which was consumed because you're listening at double speed in around one and a half hours. Where are you going to consume an intelligently directed conversation with so much to think about, so much material in one and a half hours. You can't read a book that length, for example, in a, that much time, though you could listen to an audio book, which is also an excellent use of your time. So therefore, my podcast evolved from a stage where it was a cursory look at a subject, which lasted 20 minutes, to a deep dive into subjects, which could last two, three hours, like my episode on education with Karthik, to eventually a deep dive into people, almost like oral histories, which could last, like my longest episodes are more than eight hours, but typically five hours is like a typical length I'd have these days. And I also realized that not only do people crave depth, they also crave humanness. That if I want to listen to person X, expert X on subject Y, I can go on YouTube and there'll be 50 talks, right? But if I want to really understand a person, what his life is and relate to him, you know, this format gives you the chance to be able to do that. So this was like the first of my big learnings about podcasts that privileged people, people are what matters. We relate to people and stories. And, and that's always given me the greatest satisfaction individually. And also that people crave depth. The time doesn't matter. Just sort of let it go. You know, that's fascinating. There's several things you've touched on here. One is the capacity of the brain, you know, to absorb a certain amount of information in, in unit time. Let me interrupt you and add, add something to that. One of my guests, Krish Ashok, uh, who himself consumes at 3x, he once told me that at he... 3x? He consumes at 3x. Insane. My podcast yeah. at 3x. Others yeah. might uh, vary. But he once told me about a friend of his who was sight impaired, uh, who couldn't see. So he'd have to consume everything by ear. And yeah. that person consumes at 6x. So that tells you something about the plasticity of the brain. Yeah. That in in the in the case of the vision impaired person, yeah. the brain adapted so he could listen faster, which is fascinating. Like brains are incredible. Fascinating. Yeah, that that's really amazing. But what, what, what uh, I was going to say was that there were several things you touched on. You know, one is just the capacity of the brain, but the the second thing you touched on, which sort of flies in the face of conventional wisdom, is you know we have short attention spans. And and we do like because there's there's just so much distracting us, and in part maybe because our brain is able to process this stuff, and we and we we're just easily distracted. But you're you're still somewhat unique, you know, as as a podcaster in the sense that I don't know too many podcasters who have podcasts that can go for eight hours, right? So you've really sort of tapped into something here that I guess wasn't obvious to you when you started, right? Because I, I think your initial episodes were much shorter. Yeah, my shortest episode was 11 minutes. But, you know, like, there are other podcasters who do long podcasts. I don't know who's run 8-hour podcasts, but Lex Friedman has dropped 7-hour podcasts. And I, I think he's just wonderful. He's amazing, yeah. He's wonderful. And what I really love about him and what is a, a direction that even I've evolved in 
is that his conversations can get so intimate that he can he makes himself vulnerable and uh, and one of the things i've sort of learned is that when you make yourself vulnerable when you put yourself out there the other person responds then they're not talking in sound bites anymore you know if i ask you what your father was like no one no one's asked you that before so you you're finding your own language and when yeah, you find yeah. your own language and you get into that groove yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that carries on to everything else yeah you know you you know you're talking about vulnerability and it reminds me of um you know the ex president of NYU John Sexton you know one of the best orators i know and a good friend of mine uh he was one of the early guests on my podcast and i remember you know NYU had opened a campus in Abu Dhabi and he was welcoming the inaugural class and i happened to be there for some other reason and he got up on stage and he says i want to talk about vulnerability right and that's what he talked about for 2 hours you know it was just about what it meant to be vulnerable you know and just from his time you know from when he was 10 or 11 years old and his trajectory since then the audience was you know silent for 2 hours it was it was amazing right that you do sort of tap into something when you make yourself vulnerable right and he shared all kinds of stories about his life that was just uh, fascinating and i just feel that you know most human interaction is a meeting of masks you know we are wearing mm-hmm. a mask we are adopting a persona for the other person yeah uh, but when you allow yourself to be vulnerable the mask they slide and uh, i i find that beautiful and i find that important like uh, there's a story a friend of mine once told me and i wrote a newsletter post on it and the story was that he was at a nightclub with this girl he was interested in and they were dancing and he was at the stage of weight loss which in fact i am at now where uh, you, you you know your pants are kind of slipping constantly and at one point his pants slipped and they just fell down while he was dancing and the girl with him you know said that uh, to make him comfortable said that hey don't worry that's happened to me too and i thought that that's actually a beautiful moment because in that moment everyone at the club has adopted a persona they are that particular face but in that moment first my friend gets vulnerable when his pants fall down yeah. then this girl feels that empathy imagines herself in that situation and shows a compassion of making him at ease by saying don't worry and everybody else the mirror neurons are crackling and they see that too yeah, so yeah. just for a moment and of course he didn't do it deliberately but i would have said if you did it deliberately it's a master stroke yeah. because just for a moment everybody is themselves and everybody is human and then of course in the next moment it's gone but then the point is is there a way to kind of have conversations to build those spaces where you you don't have those filters you don't have those because you know everybody's broken and fucked up man deep inside <laughs> everybody is right you know, but in the story the woman was also very kind you very know kind. and 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 a good friend of mine but told me that men often underappreciate the value of kindness you yeah. know that that you know you tend to be macho but it's kindness that really goes a long way and it's two kinds of kindness is kindness to others and is kindness to yourself because men are so busy being masculine and macho that sometimes yeah. they don't realize that hey they are themselves broken and fucked up and they need to be kind to themselves also <laughs> you know so that's another realization that i think comes with age true true or true that as i would uh, as one of my favorite expressions so i went when you uh started talking about you know your uh, trajectory uh, in life and you you mentioned this creator economy w- what did you mean by sort of the creator economy yeah so the term seems kind of cold and commercial and all of that and in a recent episode i did with eric weinstein he in fact objected to it he said use the term artist don't use creator and i was like no because you know the art the term artist seems some, sometimes to me a little bit pretentious like other people can call you an artist but should you call yourself that but anyone can be a creator an 18 year old girl who's just turned the phone camera on herself and is trying some funky things can be a creator it is too much of a burden on her to call to call her an artist so to me the creator economy is that all of us have creators within us and the creator economy or the creator ecosystem or whatever you want to call it is the field in which we sort of get to express our creativity and this is a big deal it cannot be taken for granted that today we all can express our creativity but 30 years ago that was not the case like i j- i like to contrast it with the 1990s for example and talk of five critical ways in which my life has changed as a creator right the first is a means of production that in the 1990s if i had to for example um uh, publish a piece of mine 
I don't have a printing press. I don't have anything. The internet isn't that widespread yet. As so, I got to send it to say a Times of India uh, or you know the New York New York Times, or I got to send it to a publisher if I've written a book length thing. And there are gatekeepers uh, who think in conventional ways, and it really gets hard. And at some point, I give up. And because I'm writing too little, and I give up. There, there isn't that amount of iteration necessary for me to become good at what I do because only constant iteration leads to excellence. So number one, that means a production, and that changed completely because in the '80s it changed for the written word, whereas a blogger could just go out there and for the written word it changed. I could just publish whenever I wanted, and that helped me a lot. You know, I did eight thousand posts in five years. It's irrelevant that I might look at many of them today and cringe, but that was my writing gym. I was writing all the time. It also got me noticed by the world and got me. Other writing gigs, and today even in terms of audiovisual, it's completely opened up. You know, I was telling you yesterday about like today. Of course, anybody can. Uh, our smartphone cameras are too good that we can just turn them on ourselves and shoot high quality stuff. But I was telling you yesterday about the editing software I've, I'm learning to use for a video, which is called DaVinci Resolve, and DaVinci Resolve. Used to be known for decades as a color grading software. It was a state-of-the-art color grading software. In circa 2010, Blackmagic, a company called Blackmagic, which makes cameras and other equipment, they bought it and they also added editing capabilities to that to the extent that is one of the top three editing softwares now, and along with Final Cut Pro and um, uh, the Adobe one, and. Uh, Uh, and improve the color grading so today it's vastly superior to what it was in 2010 and i can use it for free there's a paid version but no one really needs it free is enough and i can use it for free on my laptop right and in 2010 it cost 800000 dollars it only did color grading it cost 800000 dollars and you needed to buy another console on top of that with it and all hollywood and bollywood films had to have color grading done and they couldn't afford to buy it so all your bollywood films would go to the us and that would be part of the budget that you're spending money on getting the color grading done and getting it back and this is a most extreme example 800000 dollars to zero in like 7 8 years because it was zero by that time but just in every sense like i have a podcasting home studio uh, at home though we're not recording there but in in a studio right now but it was so easy for me to set up you know i've given you advice on what mics to get and all mm-hmm. of that yeah. and you and i can actually do that so the means of production are uh, have uh, you know completely uh, become open the second point is access which we've already spoken about which is the gatekeepers with their conventional ways of thinking and Today we no longer need that. I don't need anyone's permission. Like if I was to go to a gatekeeper of the past in 1995, which would probably be a radio station, and say I want to do seven-hour conversations, I'd be laughed out of the room. There's this remarkable creator who really made her name through Instagram called Miss Excel, Excel as in the software, and she she uh, decided that she had three passions in life. which was Excel, which she is really good at, and she teaches, and then there's dancing and there's EDM music. so she got out these instagram videos where she's dancing to edm music and on top there are captions and images which show you how to do a particular excel trick right any gatekeeper if you go to them and tell them we i'm going to do this they'd laugh you out of the room but there was a month in which she made 100000 a day by selling excel courses and i absolutely freaking love this because she was being authentic to herself and creating and no access required so that's how dramatically it changed my third point and an important point and i might expand this into a much longer uh, written work though i've also written essays about it is restrictive formats right in the sense that if i am a writer in 1995 an article is 800 words a book is 100000 words or whatever there are all kinds of restricted formats which arise because of constraints of the time right so a book is a certain number of pages because of the grammage of the paper and so on if you look at music for example your the convention of the 3 minute song came about because that's how much a record could hold at the turn of the 20th century the 40 minute album convention came about because that's how much an lp could hold when it was invented you know the, your uh, compact disc is 75 minutes because the story goes that uh, whoever decided on the length wanted his favorite uh, piece of music beethoven's ninth symphony to fit on it so all these formats came about because of reasons that no longer apply they are archaic right even cinema with you know 24 minutes for television so you put in commercials and make it half an hour 90 minute hollywood film 3 um, hour bollywood film 
none of these formats really matter. When I started blogging, I realized that I don't have to worry about this convention. I can write 80 words or 8,000 words. Why should I write 800 words? I don't have to adhere to house style. I don't have to attend, adhere to, uh, you know, the, to the news cycle. And similarly with video, people have realized I can do 30 seconds or I can do a nine hour live stream, some of which I watched. You know, so in terms of forms, it kind of opened everything up. Though too many of us still at the current day think in a restricted way and think in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, particular forms still. Then, the in fact, you know, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I, yeah. I, it reminds me of like, I, th I think you had a newsletter. I forget the title now. I'd written it down somewhere. Something like the medium shapes the message. Uh, no, right? the, it was, was a meditation it? on form. Yeah. And my meditation there was this, that look, if I was to do a five-minute conversation, I would not need to research. I would not even need to read the book. I would not even need to know what the author has done. I could just ask him a stock question and get away with it. If I was to do a half an hour or a one-hour conversation, chat GPT could generate the basic questions for me. When I do a five-hour conversation, uh, the form forces me to listen. And not listen to respond, but listen to understand, you know, paraphrasing a famous quote by Stephen Covey, where I'd have to get my ego out of the equation, where I'm always trying to respond to show how smart I am, but instead really sit back and listen to the person and take it in and go with that flow. And because that is a mode of thinking I have to adopt, my research changes, my research has to be much deeper. So I'm in a quieter state of mind where I'm not quickly trying to sprint through research, but actually having to soak in a lot of stuff. And then, so this is a form shaping the content and then the content shapes character because then I change, I become a better listener, I get used to thinking slowly, to absorbing, you know, larger spans of content. Everything changes. You know, it's this is fascinating because as, a, I guess, now a fellow podcaster who does shorter episodes because my assumption is that people have, you know, I mean, I started, but people have limited uh, time spans and... But I tend to prepare like crazy. You know, I mean, I tell people I read a book a week. I read everything the person's written. And I do try and channel it into 75 minutes. And I find that I don't address half the things I really wanted to address. Right. So I am actually restricting myself in that sense because I made the assumption that people have X amount of time uh, and attention is limited. So, you know, I, I wonder if I'll evolve into a longer podcaster as, as time progresses. I have actually considered that, but I, I don't know. I, I think you have something really unique, but it's fascinating just listening to you describe it like this because I, I know exactly what you mean. You have to sort of tap into uh, what the person is saying, internalize it, and just kind of go with the flow regardless of how long it takes. And I think, you know, your approach is great, your research is great, and the reason it works so well is you always have to do more research than you're going to use. Because then that gives you the depth of understanding of the subject that A, you can follow the guest into wherever they go in that subject, and B, you can ask more intelligent questions because you have a wider span of uh, sort of understanding. I'm sorry for this uh, slight diversion, uh, but by the way, this diversion reminds me of a fascinating clip I saw of this Australian guy speaking Hindi. Have you come across this one? No, it, it's amazing. It, it's on it's on the <laughs> internet somewhere, but this Australian guy, and he speaks, you know, 10 different forms of Hindi. And he says it all started with the word diversion. But he says, the guy teaching him how to speak Hindi said, let's start with diversion. And he says, in India, you say diversion. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so he says, that's how he got started. Um, but so sorry for that diversion. No, no. Uh, uh, diversions are, are, are what make life worth living, man. Indeed, they, they certainly are. Um, but let's get back to the creator economy. Yeah. Right? Because so you had, yeah. the fourth of the five aspects was connecting with the audience. Right. So if in 1995, I write a piece, for, say, for Times of India. Right. Or for, since your audience is uh, a lot of Americans, say I write a piece for New York Times. And somebody reads it and says, huh, you know the Samit Varma interesting guy, and then they forget about me. And then I write a piece six weeks later for, say, Wall Street Journal. And somebody else reads that and says, ha, name sounds familiar, interesting guy, but that's it. I can't connect directly with the audience. And ditto for any other medium. And where it changes today is today we can connect directly with the audience. Like if you, like you have a substack, right? 
everybody who's a fan of yours or a follower of your work like me can just subscribe to your substack and then whatever you want to say i'm a captive audience for it it's coming to my uh, inbox mm-hmm. right so you have another product to sell you can put it out there you have questions to ask what do you think of this you can put it out there and the, i can respond if i want to so you are actually capturing your audience you're building an audience of vasandhar followers or vasandhar fans and as priceless you know other creators will do it through using discord where they'll have regular meetings with their listeners or fans or viewers or whatever and that is priceless and that brings me to the fifth point which is money right so how does a writer let's say i'm writing for newspapers in the 1990s how do i make money i sell my piece to an envy times and envy times will aggregate eyeballs they'll sell advertising a tiny chunk of it comes to me right but it's not efficient it's not efficient because when i read something by you asant i'm re- i'm spending money on it because time is money i'm spending that 10 minutes reading your newsletter piece because i value it it is adding something to my life and i would gladly pay you some of that if i could to show my appreciation and most people would right but how how do you as a creator capture some of the value that i as a reader am placing on your work there was no way to do that earlier today there is and there was one transition where uh, you know you uh, creators began to sort of um, uh, get the advertising and the sponsorships directly you don't have to publish with an envy times i can put it out on my blog i can use google adsense or whatever or i can put a youtube video and because i have so many million followers people advertisers come to me directly you know so i don't have to publish it on you know it's not owned by anybody else it's owned by me that was a first phase the second phase is that you can get money from your audience directly you don't need advertising any more in fact i i i one of my friends varun dugirala has a podcast called advertising is dead and i've never asked him what he meant by that but i think advertising will be dead because hey if creators are connecting directly with audiences where do you need the advertising like you know in when covid began in april 2020 um i i just put an appeal out there saying that hey man i'm i'm never going to make this a subscription podcast but it takes money to keep it going i'm independent i don't make money can you help me so straight away and, and to this day it sustains a show people would just come and contribute right um, and contribute incredibly generously like 15 years ago when i was an internet professional i had the view that you know micro payments can't work too much friction blah 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 that's absolutely not true you know and secondly what i realized is that i can actually sell uh, my own product on top of this so you know i started this writing course uh, at the same time april 2020 and has got more than like 2100 students at the time of recording right so these are people who find me credible because they've heard the podcast and they know okay this guy is a serious guy or they've read my writing and so on then they sign up for the podcast and you know, that's where i make a, a fair bit of revenue and then what happens is i still have to deliver and uh, they sign up for the writing course rather i still have to deliver so because uh, now a lot of the people who come on haven't heard of the podcast they are coming on because they've got word of mouth from pe- previous people who've done the course that hey this is a really good course interesting so you're actually getting a lot of people coming not from the podcast yeah, but just yeah. because uh, that's what word happened now like when i started it i thought mm. there'll be a bunch there'll be a lot of goodwill and there'll be some regular listeners and maybe it'll last 2 3 months you know let me see how it goes yeah but it is self sustaining the demand is never ending because everyone who does it then the word of mouth kicks in you know like uh, one of my lessons like i i give six commandments for the creator economy which if you want i can share with you after this but one of them is be clear about the two r's which are reach and revenue right what are you doing for reach what are you doing for revenue and clarity helps and you need reach first you can't make revenue unless you have reach you have credibility you have a name so for me the podcast got me reach that people appreciate that this guy is being authentic he's you know thinking outside the box uh, playing a game no one else is playing that gets me credibility that gets me the reach and it gets me some revenue and then i teach this writing course and that gets me all the revenue but at the same time if it was a shit course it would end at some point so it also has to be good and then it works so you know you talked about sort of the you know how advertising is a necessary right and you know you you sort of tapped into something with your podcast but i guess for a lot of people 
just getting awareness of the podcast is a big challenge, right? And so how do you do that without some sort of advertising, right? Just to sort of get going. Yeah, I mean, the advertising I meant was the kind of advertising on my show. But yeah, I get what you're saying. And I feel like for me, a lot of it happened organically. Like I've basically tried two big attempts within what I one one could call the creator economy or the creator ecosystem. And the first was my blog, India Uncut, circa 2003-2004. And the second is The Seen and the Unseen. And both of them really grew organically. They grew really fast. They surprised me by how much they grew. So I almost have the idealistic belief that you can do this organically. However, I must confess that my sample size is low. And, that not, and I got really lucky, I admit you know, uh, both the times uh, to ha- to get the kind of audience that I did. But my sense of it is that like another of the uh, six commandments that I give is don't look at metrics. Because what I kind of believe is that if you are obsessed with the metrics and you enter this vicious circle, now what is this vicious circle? The vicious circle is when you start doing something, you will suck at it because you've started doing it. You can't be good on day one. Now, if you look at the metrics, you're looking at the metrics for something you suck at. Those metrics will be bad because firstly, you haven't had time to build an audience and secondly, you suck at it. And if you allow that to stop you, you will never become good at anything. So the important thing is to do something you love, which is another commandment. Do something you love, be authentic to yourself, but give it time. Don't look at metrics, you know, and over time as you iterate, because only iteration leads to excellence. So over time as you iterate, you'll become better and better and better. And then the audience will also pick up. Like one of my favorite YouTubers, Ali Abdal, shares this fascinating graph, which is basically an exponential growth graph. And he talks about how when he made his 50th video, after half a year, he was making two videos a week. When he made his 50th video, he reached 1,000 subscribers. Now, 1,000 subscribers is nothing. Most people would sneer at it. Most people would give up well before that. Uh, Making a video takes a lot of effort. It's more than a podcast, right? And he stuck with it. Because he stuck with it, he realized that it took two or three years for him to get going, but it became exponential. He made this video when he had hit a million subscribers. I think he has more than two million now. And his advice to creators was, if you want to make videos on YouTube, make two videos a week for two years and start looking at metrics only after that. Right? Now, at one level, me giving this advice or Ali giving this advice, you could easily say, hey, survivorship Survivorship bias. bias. That's exactly what I was thinking. You're the guys who made it. You're the guys who made it. Yeah. But at the same time, I have to tell you, Vasant, Everybody who's made it, you look at all big creators, everybody, even in podcasting, you look at Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman, Sam Harris, everybody who's made it, they made it like this. They made it being authentic to who they are, doing exactly what they want to do, not giving a shit about what others say. And then at at a point in time, it becomes organic. Yeah. So I'm not saying everyone who thinks like this will make it, yeah. but I think this is the only way to make it. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm just smiling because, you know, I'm... Uh, reminded of Scott Galloway, who's made a career out of being authentic, you know. And I used to joke with him. I tell him, you know, uh, I, I said, you know, you've really made a career by looking pissed off, you know, because he always looked pissed off, you know, whether he was in class or TV or whatever, he always looked pissed off. And uh, people seem to like that about him, you know. Uh, and now, of course, he's become more mainstream and he doesn't look as pissed off. But, you know, he made a career out of looking pissed off. But, but he was genuine. He was authentic. You know, it was coming from deep within. Yeah, and, so, and for listeners of mine who are, you know, listening to this, I must point out that Vasan's first episode was a Scott Galloway, really memorable episode. And I think that being pissed off worked because it was authentic. People could tell this yeah. is a guy. Like, along with my commandment of do what you love, I keep saying that, look, out of... Like, I taught a podcasting course briefly. I teach it twice a year. And somebody once asked me that, where is a gap in the market I should aim for? And I said that the gap in the market is you in the sense that, you know, you try to find a gap, a million other people will find the gap, you'll be catering to others, you'll never be authentic. What makes you unique from the 7 billion plus people on the planet? Only one thing, and that's you, right? So you got to be yourself. And at the same time, if people are young creators are listening to this, I would give the advice that don't fall for the imposter syndrome, which women in particular do and should not. Don't fall for the imposter syndrome of saying that, hey, what's so special about me? Why should people listen to me? Because the point is, one, each of us is unique. And two, each of us is on a a journey that is really similar to journeys that other people share, whether it's a journey through life or an intellectual journey or whatever. 
and the moment you share a part of that journey with the world at large immediately so many people tune in and say ha that's me or that was me 3 years ago or ha this person was me 3 years back and i connect with this oh i really connect with that and that's when it begins to take off so you got to be authentic to yourself but you also got to you know keep working on the craft keep iterating do you need a day job for that i think very often you do i think very yeah. often you got to be practical yeah. you know the kind of people who decide on day 0 to be creator full time creators and they say i'm going to do it i think they're doing what uh, uh, you know a classic mistake i warn creators against and which you know uh, famously has been said of futurists and science fiction writers that they overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term right so creators will jump in there and they'll think oh i'll start a podcast i'll get so many views or oh i'll start a youtube channel and i'll be this big youtube superstar and no you know unless like you're super madly lucky like an uncle roger or something on youtube that's really not going to happen you will suck for the first 6 months you will suck for the first year you'll be figuring it out but hopefully if you're doing what you like you'll enjoy it and it'll work so um, and ali abdul's graph also shows this that you know we overestimate the short term but we also underestimate the long term you know you can be really surprised by the long term in two ways and one way is maybe your channel or whatever you're doing really takes off and gets mad views and it really works and all of that but the second is that you become a different person you know one of the most memorable episodes i did on the scene and the unseen was with the uh, writer and my friend namita kumar and he spoke about journaling in that and he said that uh, he spoke about the values of daily journaling in that he's got this masterpiece of a book called the blue book which is out there which is his journaling which he did on instagram and is be- beautiful and i keep telling this to my writing students and many of them have done it but what is journaling journaling every day is a conversation with yourself a daily conversation so when you write number 1 you figure out the world a little better because you're thinking about it number 2 you figure out you figure yourself out a little better you know so if i create two thought experiments and in one of which vasanthar is not writing and in the other one vasanthar is writing every single day for 5 years then at the end of 5 years the guy who's writing is so much deeper and more nuanced and in every and why is a better shot than the other yeah is a better shot yeah. so uh, creating is also an act of self improvement no matter what kind of creative you uh, creating you're doing so yeah 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 you know you remind me of um, you know uh, people these days say you know young people want to be influencers you know and they scoff at that but you know part of me thinks that that's fine you know but if 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 that's a drive do it but don't expect sort of instant fame i i think that's where people kind of uh, underestimate what it really takes to become that i mean you can get lucky and and do something outrageous and get you know a million views and maybe you take off maybe you don't but i think what you're really saying is that this is a long game right and 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 if you're authentic chances are you know you've got a good shot at it life is a long game and it ends too soon but you know i don't like the term influencer and the term influencer and creator are different in in one critical way which is that an influencer is about how you want to be seen by the world yeah Yeah. while a creator is what you want to do this is who i am right, i right. create stuff I'm yeah so i actually i should have rephrased i i guess people want i i i guess what you would say is you know yeah you could have influence but that's the wrong place to start yeah right yeah. Uh, the the right place to start is think about what you really want to say yeah. and and even that isn't going to be obvious because like you said you'll suck at it right and and you might actually find your message much later but as long as you've got that drive and authenticity you've got a better shot at things and anyone who's been a creator will know that that the primal joy in creating comes not necessarily from the validation and all of that which is great but when you create something that you like and you just have that quiet moment with yourself and you say i really like doing this right and i think that is priceless and, 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 and deep a, down you know it's good deep down like, you know it's good or yeah. deep down you, you or, may not know it's good because you can't be objective about it and apply yeah. a term like good but deep down you know that you like doing it it made you feel good yeah. you know and i think that's that's priceless Indeed, indeed. So let's pick up on the. I like I like the commandments bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Because that's like uh, how should people think about it, right? So what what should they do? Let's continue with. So I already shared three of them. Yeah. My first one is you don't have to scale, right? So back in the day, if you were a creator, you had to scale. If you're a musician, you got to be in the top one percent where you're making uh, the chart hits. Uh, otherwise, you're nothing. You know, if you're a writer, you got to be right at the top. 
otherwise you better have a day job you're nothing right that was a whole game and today that's not the case like kevin kelly wrote this classic essay uh, i think circa 2009 2008 called a thousand true fans and uh, and it was very prescient because you know kelly's main point was that you don't have to scale that if you have a thousand true fans who pay a hundred dollars a year you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year which is extremely healthy and if you look today at substack that is literally happening a hundred dollars a year is a very standard subscription fee for them and many people are getting many more than a thousand uh, subscribers and these are not just celebrity uh, superstars these are like there's a china expert i forget his name i think bruce something uh, who will just get out there and they'll put out work that would otherwise be considered arcane by many but they get their thousand people and in his case like many more than that and you're making you know in some cases more than a million dollars a year where you're just kind of doing that and i have also found that like i'm doing 7 8 hour podcast right now i have an incredibly large audience in india even by conventional standards i'll compete with anyone but uh, you know it's it's not as uh, crazily mainstream as say a joe rogan is in the us or whatever mm-hmm. but despite that it's enough it's enough for me to be comfortable through my different revenue streams and is comfortable to kind of keep me going so you don't actually need to scale uh, if you just and I, i i think there's another writer and we'll link it from your show notes who wrote a piece called a hundred true fans where she claims that you can find a hundred true fans will give you a thousand dollars a year and that is true i've seen that happening as well like i i think it could probably be true for me if i try to apply it and find a way for people to pay and that's beautiful when when that happens the second one was my second commandment was about reach or revenue define whether you're optimizing for reach or revenue the my third commandment is build a community of your fans or followers like today when my writing students say where should i start writing should i send my work out to newspapers and this and that i say no don't do it start a newsletter first now why is that because in the mid 90s you send something to ny times it gets published 3 months later you send something to wlc it gets published but someone who appreciates your writing has no way of further tapping into the things that you do what you next write may not ever be visible to them whereas and also if you're only doing that you're writing too infrequently to become good but if you're writing a newsletter you are accumulating followers so i'll see a link by vasanthar on my twitter i follow that i say hey this is an interesting guy i subscribe for free and then everything else you do after that every message you want to send is coming to my inbox and i am building that relationship with you because you are now in my inbox periodically and i think that's incredibly priceless and i think it's spoken about you know building communities earlier as well so i won't elaborate but i think that's super important the fourth one is also important don't pigeonhole yourself like people will think oh i'm a writer or i have a face for audio as both you and i like to say <laughs> or they'll say that which is true in my case by the way which is true in both but, our case which yeah. is true in my case so you, you you're like an incredibly dignified and handsome man but <laughs> leaving you're, that aside way too kind or, yeah. yeah or people will make video and they'll pigeonhole themselves and i'm like in this day and age a creator is a creator man you have impulses you want to tell stories you want to get your feelings out you want to uh, you, you know and you can do it in different medium you know you don't have to restrict yourself to one and say ki yeah, yeah i'm only a writer or yeah this is too infra dig for me you know when i was growing up like my uh, earliest creator ambition which kind of still remains in my head is that the there's a hierarchy of things to do and the most respectable is to write a book but today i question that and say okay that's still my reflex but why why is that hierarchy there why is a book the most respectable thing i can make youtube videos i can start a channel i can do a podcast you know i can do a bunch of different things which are perfectly fine number 5 was don't obsess over metrics which i've elaborated upon number 6 was do what you love be authentic to yourself which i've also elaborated upon so i guess i guess people would think that the book was kind of the pinnacle because that's what it would take to be a rock star and and i what you're saying is you don't need to be a rock star you know it's like you, you that, that may happen down the line but that's uh, sort of incidental right that 100 fans or 1000 fans genuine connection uh, is probably going to be uh, you know result in a better outcome than shooting to be a rock star by writing a book and an outcome in two ways an outcome one in the way of success and making money and all that but an outcome in terms of you yourself and your satisfaction like your art whatever your way of creating something is will be a particular thing and will fit a particular form now we live in an age where the forms are fluid we can be whatever we want to be you know and therefore 
why do you want to force fit your work into a form where it doesn't have to belong so maybe i want to write say 600 word mini essays and maybe that's my form but then i think oh no i have to write a book i have to write serious essays and then you force fit your thinking like many non fiction books that we read nowadays started off as an essay and they were great as an essay but then some publisher went and said oh what a great essay write a book and then they stretch it out and it's all padded up chapters and all of that happening and my thing is you don't need to do that man like i understand why you do that but you don't need to do that so if you try to fit yourself into different particular forms you run the risk of corrupting your own art though at the same time it is good to experiment and try new ways of saying things mm-hmm. but really just what is your initial impulse what do you want to create now create the damn thing if you want to do a little pottery and create something with your hands just do it don't think hey this won't scale it won't scale it won't even find you a thousand true fans you're the only fan you're sitting there and you're doing that thing with the clay and that's it but the satisfaction and the joy that it gives you and makes you feel is important and in fact i say this to my students in the context of what you'll no doubt want to talk about next which is how ai affects this world where how did you guess that i would want to talk about that because uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you no, you're the yeah, ai guy yeah yeah no i i was actually going to i i was going to approach it sort of from a tools perspective ha we'll but, come to yeah, that but yeah. you know so here's the thing so my writing students will ask me that hey you're saying that you know if jerry pinto has written this great crime thriller called murder in mahim jerry was on my show in this really memorable eight hour episode and i said are you writing any more books in that series and he said no and i said okay i'll get ai to do it for you 10 years later i'll get nine more books mm-hmm. in the series as many mm-hmm. as i want an ai and even you won't be able to tell the difference and they'll be damn good and my students were like that and 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 by the way for listeners i should say that don't judge ai by the state of chat gpt today that would be like judging computing by the state of you know 2 mb mainframe computers of the 1950s that filled up an entire room ai is going to be incredible it is going to create incredible art incredible books incredible music and it will it will create work that is as good or better than any human can so now the question that my students ask me is what is there for us should we be disheartened by this and my whole point is no because you can be a creator for two reasons you can be a creator because you want validation and success fine you know you have 10 years to do it or whatever period of time to do it after that is going to get tough because you're going to have the best art and the best music and the best books and you won't be able to tell human or ai and you're competing against that it's tough so the validation and the success is one part of it but the other part of it is just the joy of creating no one can take that away from you you know like sometimes i'll sit down in a quiet spot and i'll write a four line poem and it'll just fill me with a peace and a happiness and which is indescribable and no one can take that away from me so we have to learn in a certain sense i think to cultivate that joy of doing that too often we are driven by superficial thin desires of getting the validation and getting the fame but the real thick desire for any creator should really be the act of creation so let's push on this creation and and ai right because what's 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 AI, how is ai going to impact creation right because um on the one hand it's able to do pretty amazing things even now right it's hard to say but i i think one can you know reasonably project that it'll continue to get better at a at a pretty fast clip What does this mean? Does it mean it's going to displace creators or make them even more creative? I think what's kind of going to happen is like I was having this discussion with a good friend of mine called Ajay Shah and we were discussing this in the context of what's going to happen in the world of code. That India has over the last couple of decades produced so much so many code coolies who are just like executing, right? What's going to happen to them? And both of us kind of agreed that the code coolies are going to go, but anyone who thinks at a higher order of thinking they now have tools they could not have imagined before it's like having a million code coolies at your disposal with the kind of ai that you have and they are going to thrive and they are going to create so much value that hopefully you create jobs for the code coolies who no longer have them and i would extend this across the board and i would say your mediocre illustrators your run of the mill copywriters they are gone if there is a copy shop which is basically right now a creative director and 10 copywriters the 10 copywriters are gone is going to be a creative director who knows how to prompt right so the thing is if you can do that higher order level of thinking 
then it's fine. Then you have tools at your disposal which are incredible and you'll do a lot with them. But if you are just going through the motions and not really thinking beyond that, then in the short term you have a problem. You lift yourself to the higher order or you wait till other opportunities open up. Now, typically when any technology comes, uh, foolish Luddites will say, oh, it's going to displace so many people. And, you know, that's a classic scene in the unseen. The scene is, yeah, it'll displace some people, but then the, uh, the productivity gains that it brings about will employ those people and more. So eventually we'll all be better off and it's a huge net positive. Never in the history of humanity uh, has there been a technology which is advancing so rapidly that the disruption may happen before the other adjustments do. You know, the disruptions may happen, the jobs may be lost before the productivity gains kick in and before they get applied to different sectors and new jobs open up. And that's a great unknown unknown and I don't know where that's going. But I would just advise all creators that look at it as an opportunity. Think about the different ways in which you can sort of use AI for you. And already, you know, we give AI and, you know, you're a far greater expert in AI than I am. So I'll ask for your views on this also. But already, you know, the thing with AI is that once it gets normalized, you don't think of it as AI anymore. Like, I use GPS today to figure out the fastest route here. Mm -hmm. It is fucking magical. You tell me in 1993 I can do this, I would laugh in your face. It is science fiction. Yeah. You know, it is Star Trek. But I can use GPS, you know, G we've normalized GPS, we've normalized so many things that just go on in our little smartphones, which are such incredible machines, right? We normalize all of that. So similarly, just think of what is happening in AI as tools that you can use to make yourself better and to do better work. And always remember that the, the, the joy of creation, that's nothing matches that. So embrace that. So, you know, there's this writer's strike going on in California as we speak. I think it's been going, going on for a month. And, you know, they want you know, some of the usual stuff, higher wages, you know, residual income on shows that become hits stuff like that. But I've heard at the center of this, which hasn't been reported that much in the media, is just a fear. And plus they want a certain number of people to be guaranteed, you know, employees of the studios. But at this, you know, like I said, the unspoken part here, the unseen so far is what's, you know, what's AI going to do to, you know, these writers? And I can... I can sort of sense their fear. You know, I, I suspect that they're sort of at the losing end of this. In previous strikes, you know, off, I think it was the Workers Guild of America, but I'm not sure about this. They actually had leverage over studios. I mean, they were the writers, right? And they produced the content and, you know, they'd had, they did have leverage. They have so much less now. And I suspect that they're sort of seeing the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel and saying, wow, you know, if a certain studio wants to make a new version of Played Again, Sam, that's set in Harlem with Ghetto Talk, you know, they can do it, right? And so far we've seen ChatGPT, but I can imagine video uh, GPT, you know, coming, you know, emerging, you know, in a few years where you'd say, and not just, not only write the script, just make the movie too and, and create, you know, a synthetic actor and you can't tell the difference, right? I mean, I can imagine in that kind of a brave new world, you know, where the machine is just sort of creating, you know, based on like prompts that you give it, what's the, you know, what, what is that future going to look like for human creators? Three points. I think, you know, that one word that, uh, and this is just a sideways point, but it kind of triggers me that uh, those writers who want to be guaranteed that, you know, a certain amount of jobs are there for them in each studio. I think that is such a bullshit attitude to have. It shows no self-respect whatsoever. Nobody owes anyone anything. You know, you're not, uh, what I tell myself and others is that we are not entitled to anything. We have to work for it, right? We have to earn it. So this whole guaranteed word really puts me off. And I think any self-respecting writer should never ask for guarantees. Do it with your work. The other thing I'd point out is that at least at this moment in time and for the foreseeable future, you have generative AI basically working of uh, uh, LLMs. And because of Sturgeon's law, that 97% of everything is crap, you know, 
what what generative ai will come up with most of the time is basically mediocre it is going to be mediocre because 97% of everything is crap like a lot of the prose that chat gpt brings out right now is prose that i would not allow my writing students to use like i just give them a freaking refund if they use prose like that because it is banal and cliched and you know just badly written so i think that there is still a space for writers to do a higher order of thinking where a, a, a writer can go in out there and say here is my story give me a three act structure break it down into beats yeah ai can do all of that but then when you're filling in those gaps where you're filling in dialogue that feels real where you're filling in those little bits where a particular choice of word makes someone in the audience start crying you know that's not something that right now ai can do not so right I, now not right now maybe it happens in the future i don't know man but the point is that have some self respect don't ask for freaking guarantees and all of that have faith in yourself that you know i'll still do great work you know screw the shit i'll still do great work there's a new tool in town i'll use that tool the studio won't know how to use that tool right the studio is basically suits right what are they going to do they still will, the writer will still use that tool better than the studio can so take the tool on that final act of higher order thinking and creation is at least now still in your hands and thirdly i agree with you about video gpt and it is scary to the extent because what i've started doing recently is examining deep fakes and so on just out of interest not for pornographic purpose and i've realized that they are so real that it is incredible like i can show you after this you know you take any film scene in movie history featuring two men and i can put your face and my face there mm-hmm. and nobody will be able to tell us not you or me it is so mind blowing already yeah. and with images you can give any prompt uh, you know not of the major models like mid journey and stable diffusion because they won't uh, you know generate some things they'll avoid porn and all that uh you can give prompts and you can get in- such realistic images that no one can tell them apart even the person themselves and is going to happen with video you know like one of my fantasies which i've shared is to have malik arjun mansoor and bhimshen yoshi singing together a jugalbandi in a raga neither of them has sung before and it being so good that fans of both men die of ecstasy and nobody can tell it didn't happen right and i think you and i would agree that it's only a matter of time and i agree with you that it's only a matter of time it happens on video but you know i might know the creator economy a little bit you know ai much better so i'm going to throw this back at you you tell me what do you feel well i feel that and you know i'm going to echo what you just said that i think it's a matter of time right you know if you think about what the machine has access to right it's got access to the collective expression of humanity at the moment in language right so everything that human beings have expressed in language is now available to the machine as training data right now imagine a world where a machine can now actually see because a lot of our learning experience is visual right the vision has a huge impact on how we feel learn everything sort of smell by the way but you know let's just ignore that for for the moment right machines haven't even started to like work with vision yet or learn i mean some of my colleagues are doing work on you know how do babies learn they they are attaching cameras to their heads right and see how how we learn from vision which is a incredibly rich uh, medium so i can imagine you know as machines become good at seeing the world the same way that humans get good at seeing the world and machines in a sense are a sort of more a better version of intelligence than we are right and we forget things we die you know generational knowledge disappears no such thing of the machine right never forget anything it's just it's just accumulates yeah you know? and and so we're sort of in this era now which used to be science fiction but it's very real now right and it's happening at, at an incredible rate and i just sort of you know i'm i'm wistful of the fact or, or lament the fact that i'm not going to be around to to see this when this really kind of takes off but i can imagine like in 10 20 30 years you know when machines become really good at vision at creating images at creating movies uh, and as you point out you know this concert where people are doing stuff that they've never done before just mind boggling right and completely sort of you know out of the bo- uh, ballpark now i will say that it boggles my mind doubly because for most of my career ai has overpromised and underdelivered right 
But now it seems be, to be the opposite, right? That people in AI sort of have an embarrassment of riches that they're now trying to explain why the machine is so good, uh, is, is as good at it, uh, as it is. And I suspect that's just going to, you know, run away from us. So and I have to say, I completely object to your saying that you won't live long enough to see all this. We were just discussing outside how we're all going to live till 120. So we will live long enough to see all of this. And, you know, what you said about a higher order of intelligence really resonates with me. Because uh, when I see people's, a lot of people's sort of skeptical responses to AI, I find that an illustration of human hubris. Right. I tell them that you're overvaluing human intelligence massively. Like the reason we, you and I are able to have this conversation is that we have been trained on an LLM, which is much smaller than what AI gets trained on. And our ability to process it and retain it is also much smaller than AI. Right. And we attach mystical terms to what appears to be acts of creation only because we don't understand yet how they happen in the brain. But actually, AI will be as creative as us, as imaginative as us all of these things. There is no way it cannot, in fact. It is ludicrous to imagine that it cannot. We have created a higher order of intelligence and, you know, that's my sense of it. And I'm like, it's fine. Don't have so much hubris. You know, be humble. We are organic mortal beings, you know, destined to die and hopefully destined to find happiness where we can, but that is within our control. So, you know, just have a good life, create good things. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, what's happening in AI is just just mind-boggling, right? I I was um, uh, watching something yesterday, and uh, I know that people have been doing research where the machine can actually, um, if you're looking at something, the machine can actually look at your brain and tell what you're looking at. Amazing. Right? It can actually tell what object you're looking at. I was, uh, you know, going through some literature yesterday where I, where people are now showing that it can actually tell what you're reading. Right? So you can actually be reading something and a machine can actually tell what you're reading, right? So, you know, I, I don't know where this is going, but clearly, right, we're heading towards a future where, you know, ultimately will be will will sort of humans will come into a world of incredibly intelligent machines. And I wonder what that kind of brave new world is gonna look like, but it just boggles my mind. Yeah, and I think maybe it'll be a a, a world where we pretend to be less infallible and we embrace our vulnerability to go back to, you know, the theme that we were talking about earlier and we just embrace what it is to be human because I think to be human is not to be really good at art or really good at this or really good at that because machines are going to be better at all yeah. of that. But to just enjoy it. <laughs> just yeah, enjoy to, being human. But to just yeah. enjoy it, just yeah. enjoy the connections, just enjoy, uh, you know, all of those things. And uh, It reminds me of a quote by... Jeff Hinton, right, where he where he says uh, about these language models, like he says, it's it's like aliens have arrived, but we're having a hard time taking it in because they speak such good English. <laughs> no, and there's a great quote by Peter Heine Nelson, uh, Magnus Carlsen's coach. You know, when Alpha Zero first came and did what it did in chess, where it destroyed Stockfish, which was otherwise state yeah. of the art. And, yeah. you know, uh, Carlsen is about 2850 ELO rating. Stockfish was should, should, have, should have been about 3500. Yeah. Alpha Zero just came and with machine learning destroyed Stockfish. And Peter Heine and Nelson said that I've always wondered what it would be like if a superior alien civilization came to Earth and started playing chess with us. And now I know. Yeah, amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, to, to think of a world where we're born and there's already this alien intelligence here that's been around for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been around for a while. <laughs> you know, it's been around a lot longer, you know, than, than individuals are. So, I mean, the future is all unknown unknowns, but it's fascinating to think about how a kid growing up in that world, how they would relate to the world because, you know, our minds may rebel against it because humans are so used to thinking of ourselves as the masters of the universe. Yeah. But for that, you know, some humility, some acceptance of what you are, some acceptance of why other humans should be special to you, I think it can actually improve human relations and just, just make us better people. On the other hand, it could just destroy the planet. So that, that's a different <laughs> matter. Well, Amit, it's been uh, 
Fascinating. You know, thanks for this conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And it's great to actually finally meet you in the flesh. Like, I mean, I guess that's part of being human. Right? That's part of being human. And that's that's what I've really enjoyed the most. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on your show. It's such a delight to be on after all the accomplished guests you've had on. And uh, yeah, here's to many more conversations. Indeed. Here's to many more conversations. Thanks again.